Let's talk about the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, switching to the other part of the world in Asia. The detained suspects were requesting provisional release based on their health, their age, and other factors, and the first big decision of the tribunal was, no, you cannot go home. You're going to stay here where we can keep you close at hand, and your trials can begin. The next big decision was that the Cambodian Tribunal was the first to decide to have civil parties, parties civil, victims, defense counsel. And this became a real problem because thousands of people wanted to be involved in these proceedings as civil parties. What they decided to do is handle it a bit like in the United States we handle class action suits. They created classes of these victims. They have four of those, there are four defense counsel, or I'm sorry, victims counsel that are working alongside the prosecution. But it has created so many hassles for both the prosecution and the court, you can't even imagine. And so the International Criminal Court, which also has this ability, is watching very closely to see what works and doesn't work with respect to this new concept of victims' parties. There was an interesting decision that said consensual statements made without a lawyer present are admissible, and this was in the case of Nguyen Che, who was also known as Brother Number Two, the, the leading lieutenant in the Khmer Rouge. He um, was told of his right to a counsel, and he blurted out lots of information and said he didn't want a lawyer, and he literally has convicted himself before his trial has begun. And his lawyer finally said, let's exclude all those statements, and the court said, no, nope, they were freely given, and he waived his right and wouldn't allow the statements to come in. Another really controversial decision by the Cambodian Tribunal involved whether torture evidence could be used. Uh, this was interesting because I wrote an article two years ago in the Washington Lee Law Review called When, if ever, can torture evidence be admissible? And it actually was focusing on this very case. It was almost as if I wrote it in a Law Review article for one case. It got really bizarre when the briefs were filed and the defense brief has a section that says, Professor Sharp is wrong. <laughs> uh, well, apparently the court didn't see it that way because they just ruled uh, last month that these um, biographical statements that detainees gave to their interrogators at S21, either before or during interrogation sessions that included um, probably torture and other things that normally we wouldn't want to see and would be um, excluded under the exclusionary rule in Article 15 of the Torture Convention. Well, they said that those could come in because some of them were given before the torture actually commenced. The personnel of the Cambodian Tribunal were not involved in these interrogations, and most importantly, that they, the evidence is being used against the superiors of the people who committed the torture rather than against the people subject to torture. This is admittedly a very controversial decision. It has implications around the world, especially as countries grapple with how to interrogate terrorist detainees. And so it's worth reading and it's online. Um, another case in Cambodia to tell you about is the Doyle case, which is pro progressing. Um, he decided he was going to tell the world what he did and be remorseful. It's a really interesting uh, approach to defense. You know who had that defense, by the way? Um, Albert Speer. And it worked for Speer, too. In fact, it worked so well that Doyle's lawyer sent, uh, well, came all the way to Cleveland. And just before Henry King passed away, he did an affidavit in which the lawyer said, look, tell us about Albert Speer. Tell us about the remorse defense. And basically, what Henry said was, in Albert Speer's case, he was the only Nazi in Herber to say, what I did was terrible. It was heinous. I wish I hadn't done it. I was captured in the, the cult personality of Adolf Hitler. And, and I feel absolutely terrible about it. And I should be punished. And of all the people who got punished, he got the, less, the least punishment because the court sort of felt sympathetic to him and was happy that he had taken that position. So Doig, who was the commander of S-21, a place where 15,000 people went in and only seven are known to have come out alive, uh, he's trying to say in defense. Not sure it's going to work so well for him, but um, what it does do is it's become, an, and this was just uh, an email to me in the most recent version of um, War Crimes Prosecution Watch, it is made for fabulous television because 
Doi is confessing to everything in minute detail, and the people in Cambodia are for the first time able to see one of these former leaders tell it like it is. And you know, in a regular war crimes trial, the defendant will say right to the end, I'm innocent. This is not fair. This is Victor's justice. And the people that are supporters of the defendant sometimes believe that. At Nuremberg, unfortunately, there were surveys taken years later that showed that a majority of Germans thought that Doreen was innocent that the trial was not fair. And when you have someone like Doyle saying, I did it, and this is what I did, it is a whole new ballgame. And it's really cathartic and important, and it, it is meaning that the Cambodian Tribunal is having a real impact in Cambodia. It, the Cambodian Tribunal is now also poised to decide the question of joint criminal enterprise liability. For those of you who aren't steeped in international criminal law, JCE, as it's known, as the defendants call it, just convict everyone, is a doctrine that is basically like U.S. conspiracy law. And the civil law countries, including Cambodia, didn't really have it. The question is, did this doctrine come out of Nuremberg? Because it's clearly customary international law now, it was well settled in the 1999 Tadic opinion by the Yugoslavia Tribunal, but for the Cambodians, they can only apply law as it existed in 1995, I'm sorry, 1975 to 1979, which is when the atrocities occurred during the Khmer Rouge. So you have to rewind the clock and say, what was the state of law back then? And the only law in the books was Nuremberg. So the big debate was, did Nuremberg create joint criminal enterprise liability or not? And was what happened in Nuremberg instant customary international law, or some of us call it a Groschen moment? which was codified in the Nuremberg Principles by the General Assembly. And that's what's being debated. It has not yet been decided, but the International Criminal Court is looking very closely at that because they too are having what some people are calling a Darwinian struggle between civil law and common law. And it is coming to a head over the question of joint criminal enterprise, which will emerge victorious, or there's probably also a third alternative that there would be a hybrid. Okay, enough about Cambodia, but hopefully that went your appetite as those trials are commencing. Special Court for Sierra Leone. We heard that the RUF trio was found guilty of crimes against humanity, including, most importantly, the separate count for forced marriage as a crime against humanity. And as Dave Crane pointed out, this was something that very early on, um, Dave's office sent us a memo to work on right about the time they were doing their indictment, and we gave them a lot of ammunition to go ahead we think this should be recognized as a new crime against humanity. We think that the court should go forward with that. I subsequently wrote a book chapter, which Dave told you about, and now it has become the law, but it's on appeal. So we'll have to see how that all plays out. Uh, incidentally, not all of everything involving the Sierra Leone situation is playing out in the international tribunals. Back in the United States in September of 2008, the United States tried and convicted Chucky Taylor, Charles Taylor's son, of torture under our own domestic torture statute. First case ever to be tried in the United States involving a foreigner who committed torture abroad. He was convicted, and that case is on appeal in the United States. Um, speaking of Charles Taylor, his trial has moved on now to the defense phase, as I mentioned earlier. and. Um, Mostly what you're seeing is him trying to challenge the linkage evidence. He's saying, yes, in fact, all those things occurred, but I wasn't responsible for them. Let me say this in conclusion and then open it up for questions. The several international tribunals are hitting their stride. At the same time, they're under tremendous pressure to wrap up their proceedings. Meanwhile, the existence of the International Criminal Court is spurring the creation of domestic war crimes tribunals and even domestic cases. A commentator recently wrote that with the explosion of case law, the area of international criminal law is now engendering more scholarship and more interest than, quote, much more important areas of international law. And that's a problem. Not sure if it is a problem. It's clearly a, a success for international criminal law, and I now welcome your questions, comments, and thoughts. Thank you.